with neurocrine. I'm sorry, with who? With neurocrine, biosciences. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us in person and over the phone. We're going to get started. We actually have a fairly easy agenda today, so thank you for joining us. So our agenda today, we're joined by Sandra Park, the senior staff attorney um, from ACLU, and Hans Sauer uh, with BIO um, to discuss a congressional patent proposal. Um, Eric Sid with NCAT, the Office of Rare Disease Research, to discuss the Rare Disease Registry Program. Patricia Egan with the Lymphedema Treatment Act update. We're joined by Lindsay Cundiff with the Every Life Foundation um, to give us an update on the Community Congress. And then I'll also give a brief update on Rare Across America at the end. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Sandra. Sandra, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Great. Sure, of course. Sorry about that. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, um, and I appreciate, Shannon, the opportunity to speak with our DLA folks. Um, I am going to talk a little about the patent proposal that's currently been put out um, on a bipartisan basis in the Senate and the House by um, some senators and representatives, um, and our concerns about this proposal um, and what we think uh, its impact would be on um, patient communities. So just to give folks a little bit of background on who I am, I work at the ACLU, I'm in the national office, and I was part of the legal team that brought a challenge several years ago to patents that were granted by the patent office uh, claiming uh, human DNA. And I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the law um, in broad strokes and then what that case um, was about and some of the other Supreme Court cases. Uh, that this current congressional patent proposal is seeking to um, abrogate and why we're so concerned about it. Um, so the Patent Act, uh, Section 101, for over 150 years, uh, has been interpreted by the Supreme Court and other courts to prohibit patents on laws of nature, products of nature, and abstract ideas. Um, and the basic idea there is that, you know, if we allow patents on laws of nature, products of nature, and abstract ideas, we're locking up the fundamental um, things and ideas that we want people in all contexts to be able to work with to actually develop um, other types of inventions that are appropriate for patenting. Um, and so some of the early cases on this are listed here where the Supreme Court um, was looking at, you know, is what is um, trying to be patented, is it a work of nature, or does it have markedly different characteristics from any found in nature? Next slide, please. So, as I mentioned, the case has gone back over a century, but there were three recent cases uh, that has have gained a lot of attention, um, and they're listed here. I'm going to just talk very briefly about the first two, the Mayo case, and then the case that we litigated on behalf of 20 plaintiffs, uh, the Myriad Genetics case. Um, but all, in all three of these cases, the Supreme Court held that what had been patented um, was actually a, a law of nature, product of nature, or abstract idea, and unanimously held that those patents were invalid because of that. Next slide, please. So this is complicated, and uh, I just wanted to show you um, one example of a patent claim that was challenged in the Mayo case, that first case from 2012 that was listed. Um, this was a patent where uh, the Mayo Clinic was sued um, because they were accused of infringing a method. And if you look at the elements, and this is a lot of language, but basically the different steps of this method were administering a drug. Um, and then you determine the level of metabolites um, after, after administering the drug. Um, and then once you determine that level, which is in the sub, uh, in step B there, um, you then look and see, well, does the level of the metabolite, is it below a certain level or above a certain level? And if it's below, then you need to increase the amount of the drug. If it's um, above, you need to decrease the amount of the drug. 
And so that was the basic patent claim, and that's where the Supreme Court held that, you know, this patent claim isn't actually trying to patent the drug. You know, the patent holder didn't create a new drug. What the patent holder did was observe this biological relationship between the level of a metabolite and the need to increase or decrease the drug level. And that biological relationship is a law of nature that should not be patented. Um, and one of the problems with this patent claim was that because the patent holder had been able to obtain it, Mayo was actually unable to develop its own test where it slightly adjusted the drug, uh, the metabolite levels that would indicate the needs of the drug, um, whether it needed to be adjusted. And in doing so, Mayo was not able to then um, create that test because of the patent holder's ability to uh, lock up this law of nature. Next slide, please. So then the case that I'm mostly going to talk about is the Miri Genetics case. And just to give folks a little bit of background about what that case was about, um, back in 1987, the Patent Office issued a policy where it said it would, it would grant patents on so-called isolated DNA. Um, and so when scientists were sequencing the genome and found um, portions of genes or DNA, the first that were able to describe the sequence and so-called isolate it were able to obtain patents on it. The problem is isolating just meant removing it from the human cell. Um, so they were still isolating and claiming the human genetic sequences that people um, had in their bodies. And by doing so, um, they, were also they could also prevent others from working with that DNA. Uh, because isolation is a prerequisite step for any sort of testing or other types of scientific work with that DNA. So by allowing patents on isolated DNA, uh, the patent office allowed patent holders to then have the ability to exclude others from working with those portions of human DNA. So the case dealt with specific patents that were issued on the BRCA1 and 2 genes. And those are genes that are linked to hereditary risk for breast and ovarian cancers, as well as many other types of cancers. Um, and those are just two of the genes that the Patent Office uh, issued patents on. There were many, many thousands of others. Um, and Myriad Genetics obtained the patents on these two genes. And in doing so, they then were able to send cease and desist letters to other labs that were providing testing of the BRCA1 and 2 genes, um, even when those labs were using other testing methods. Because as I said uh, earlier, they, could, they actually controlled who could work with the isolated DNA. So even if a lab was using a different testing method, they still couldn't work with that DNA because of the rights that Myriad had obtained. Next slide, please. So for example, one of the patent claims that Myriad obtained um, is listed here. And it says an isolated DNA coding for a BRCA1 polypeptide said polypeptide having the amino acid sequence set forth in the sequence ID. Um, so basically, they were claiming the isolated DNA that coded for the BRCA1 protein. Um, and that uh, isolated DNA was important for um, looking at whether that sequence um, was you know, similar to what would be considered the normal sequence or not. Um, but that was the DNA that they claimed and that many people could well have if your own DNA was isolated from your cell. Next slide. Another type of claim that they obtained was a method claim, where they essentially claimed any process for comparing um, a nucleotide sequence for what might be considered a mut mutant BRC2 allele with the wild type sequence. And the wild type sequence is just considered the normal sequence. Um, and they said, well, any difference between the suspected mutant DNA and the wild type sequence would identify a mutation in the nucleotide sequence. And we were very concerned about this because, again, this was claiming any sort of comparison um, between a person's BRCA2 sequence and the reference sequence, regardless of what test testing method or other type of analysis could be used to do that comparison. Next slide, please. So what we saw with all of this is there were a lot of different impacts in the BRCA context as well as um, with respect to other patented genes. 
Um, with respect to BRCA1 and 2, uh, Myriad used its patent rights to claim a monopoly on clinical testing of BRCA1 and 2 in the United States. It could charge the price that it wanted to charge, and over time, um, its prices went up, even as the cost of providing genetic testing went down. There were concerns about the type of testing it provided, including how it divided um, its tests into two different tests and at times did not include certain mutations that were known to the scientific community as connected to hereditary cancer risk. Um, and I also listed here a reference to a report done by the HHS Secretary's Advisory Committee on Genetics, Health, and Society, which looked at DNA patents more broadly and found that uh, patents on genetic discoveries did not play a significant role in motivating research, and in fact, in some cases, harmed research. Uh, because it discouraged the type of follow-on research we'd want to see after a gene was identified. That report also found that these types of patents were not needed to develop testing and actually sometimes impeded the development of the test. Next slide, please. So these were the 20 plaintiffs that brought the lawsuit, um, and it was a mixture of organizations, geneticists, patients, and genetic counselors. Uh, and the U.S. Patent Office, Mirror Genetics, and other patent holders were sued. Next slide. So actually six years ago today, the Supreme Court issued its decision in the case. It was a unanimous decision written by Justice Thomas, and they held that isolated DNA is not patent eligible under Section 101 of the Patent Act, that it should be considered a product of nature, and Justice Thomas wrote, Myriad did not create anything. To be sure, it found an important and useful gene, but separating that gene from its surrounding genetic material is not an act of invention. Next slide. Um, part, there are many ramifications to the decision. I'll note that on the same day the decision came out, five labs immediately announced that they would begin offering genetic testing on BRCA1 and 2 that they were not previously able to provide because of the patents. Um, and the testing that was provided was cheaper as well as more comprehensive and that labs could now um, include those two genes in analyzing the many genes that are connected to breast and ovarian cancer hereditary risk. And I have a quote here from NIH Director Francis Collins, who hailed the decision as a victory for all those eagerly awaiting more individualized gene-based approaches to medical care. Next slide. So this is our backdrop for why we are so concerned about the Coon, Senators Coons and Tillis bill draft that was released in May. Um, I'll say that after the Mayo, Myriad, Alice decisions, there have been multiple proposals um, issued by various patent bar attorney associations uh, to rewrite Section 101 um, and to either limit or get rid of the prohibition on patenting laws of nature, products of nature, and abstract ideas. Um, the senators held closed-door roundtables with various stakeholders. Um, we were not involved in those roundtables and um, other Entities were that, you know, we thought um, more, they should have been more open, especially to the patient advocacy community as well as the larger scientific community. Um, and there have been hearings that have been held June 4th, 5th, and 11th, uh, again with 45 witnesses, but none that represent centrally patient advocacy organizations. Next slide, please. I just wanted to take out some quotes from the draft bill that particularly concern us. Um, so the first section 100K, um, it says the term useful means any invention or discovery that provides specific and practical utility in any field of technology through human intervention. I and mean, then one of the reasons that concerns, uh, concerns us is that the main argument used by the Patent Office and Myriad in talking about why they should be able to obtain patents on genes um, is that there was human intervention and in that humans isolated the DNA. Um, but what was the problem with that was is that in isolating the DNA and obtaining patents on that, they essentially locked up that genetic information um, to exclusive property rights. Um, and so we're very concerned that any patent um, law that allows for patents to be 
issued on laws of nature or products of nature because of human intervention is a very low threshold and would still allow for the types of patents um, that we saw before those Supreme Court decisions came out. Next slide, please. The other language that is very concerning to us from the draft bill is that it specifically says the provisions of Section 101 shall be construed in favor of eligibility. And eligibility just means eligibility to be granted patents. Um, and then it goes on to say no implicit or other judicially created exceptions to subject matter eligibility, including abstract ideas, laws of nature, or natural phenomena shall be used to determine patent eligibility under Section 101. And all cases establishing or interpreting those exceptions to eligibility are hereby abrogated. So that's explicit language from the draft bill that will abrogate the Supreme Court's decisions, including the decisions in Mayo and Myriad, and will also uh, erase the judicially created exceptions for abstract ideas, laws of nature, or natural phenomena, which we believe have played a very important role in limiting how far patents can go in locking up basic natural things or abstract ideas for others to use. So we have begun organizing in opposition to this draft bill and any other language that would uh, get rid of the prohibitions on products of nature, laws of nature, and abstract ideas from patent protection. Uh, we sent up a coalition letter that was signed by 169 organizations, um, and the sign, signers are listed here. Um, there's actually a, a revised version of this letter with more organizations that have since signed on. Uh, next slide. And next slide, yep, thanks. So um, we are encouraging folks to take action, to contact their members of Congress that are involved in this debate right now. Um, and I've listed some of the key representatives and senators on this slide and happy to send around these slides. Um, if that makes sense through RDLA after this webinar. And then next slide. And we've also um, released some communications resources, including a blog post uh, from me and Kate Ruane, who is our legislative counsel working on this. Um, there was a story in the Washington Post, um, and there were some other uh, communications resources. And then I've also listed the website about the gene patent litigation for anyone who's interested. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions if, if that's useful. Thank you so much, Sandra. Um, I don't see any, usually we get questions if people have any um, through the chat, and I don't see any at the moment. Um, but I would encourage folks that if you do have specific questions, perhaps you can get in touch with, with Sandra, or um, you can go ahead and email me or call me, and um, I can give you uh, the contact information. I wanted to turn it over to Hans, Hans Sauer with um, Bio. He's the Deputy General Counsel for Intellectual Property. Um, Hans, um, are you are you here on the line? Let's see. We don't hear you, Hans, if you're trying to speak. So hold on. Um, while we figure this out. Oh, can you okay. pass her and let her know we got a call? Okay. We are on the call. But we got to dial in there. That's why, so she can see you. Okay. Um, How are we going to so read the number? 1650. <laughs> um, I, I think I hear, um, I, I think I hear some folks. Is that, is that Hans on the line? Um, All right, hold on. I okay, Hans, now. Okay. Are you there? No, I'm on. There we go. Can you hear me now? Perfect. No. Yes. Go ahead. 
Well, uh, thank you for your patience. Thanks for having me. And, uh, and also, thanks for the opportunity to provide a little more context around uh, uh, what Congress is trying to achieve with its current patent proposal. Um, but you know, first, just one or two words about uh, myself and about bio, right? So bio is a biotechnology trade association, and we represent mainly like small companies and development stage companies in the United States who work across the board in all areas of biotechnology. Um, we have uh, pertinent, I think, to the call, uh, not very many members who work really in diagnostic services. So companies like Myriad uh, don't feature a lot in our membership. Myriad itself is not a bio member. It's our work is mainly in the area of therapeutic products um, and uh, you know precision medicine uh, and and similar like cutting edge areas of biotechnology where we focus on therapies. Okay. So, um, the uh, uh, Congress currently is, is seeking to deal with, I think, the consequences of three Supreme Court decisions that were rendered over the last 10 years, right? And these three Supreme Court decisions in the patent space have uh, uh, led to increasing uncertainty across industries. Uh, so this is not just a biotechnology phenomenon, but it affects other industries as well, as I'm going to like explain briefly in the following. But what is at stake, and as Ms. Park explained to you, is, are these areas of judicial exceptions to patentability. But in order to get a patent, uh, it is and always was a requirement that you have to show that what you claim to have invented is new, compared to everything that came before it in human technology that is unobvious, it needs to be properly described, it needs to have a form of industrial or technical applicability. And, and the patent law also has a special provision, and this is what uh, Ms. Park meant when she referred to Section 101. At the very beginning of the Patent Act, there is a provision that says, uh, here are the kinds of things that we will even consider for patenting. Right? The kinds of things that are inside the patent system are new machines, uh, new manufactured articles, new compositions of matter like new chemicals, or new and useful processes. So these are like the categories of things that people would expect inventions to fall into. Right? So uh, a patent will only be granted if any such thing that's claimed to be invented uh, meets a whole number of requirements. The court, over time, um, has developed exceptions to this that are not grounded in the patent law itself. Right? These are judge-made exceptions, and they go back to old cases where the court, in side remarks, really, in its decisions has said, and oh, by the way, of course, things like the heat of the sun and a new plant found in the wild or a mineral that's merely discovered in the earth, these kinds of things, of course, aren't patentable because they're not inventions, right? They weren't made by anyone. Right? They were just found somewhere in that state, and why should anyone be able to patent that if it was always there and if it really hasn't been tweaked or changed in any way by people? Now, these exceptions, since these, this most recent series of Supreme Court decisions, um, have changed and they've begun to expand in U.S. patent law in unpredictable ways and also in ways that weren't expected when the Supreme Court decisions came out. These exceptions to the kinds of things that we will be allowed for patenting now affect inventions in fields ranging from artificial intelligence uh, to industrial enzymes, business software, uh, personalized drug treatments, telecommunications, uh, modern fermentation technology, even electric vehicle charging networks and things, right? So this is, it has become a cross-industry problem. Um, the lower courts and the patent office, as well as, you know, many sectors of U.S. industry have expressed frustration with this uncertain state of the law and these expanding exceptions to patentability. 
the lower courts and the patent office have asked for help and for further clarification, but so far the Supreme Court, even though it's had many opportunities, has declined to further elucidate its past decisions over the last 10 years. Right? So um, the result is that inventions that were and are patentable in the countries of our major trading partners and in competing countries right, are no longer patentable here. Right? And it's understandable, I think, that Congress would begin to show an interest in this state of affairs if technologies like artificial intelligence, uh, precision medicine, telecommunications, or, or, or charging technology for electric vehicles, to name a few, uh, are no longer uh, clearly patentable in the United States, but patentable in China or in Europe, even in Canada. Right? And these are all, you will notice, technologies that most people would agree are important for international uh, economic and technological competitiveness that Congress would show an interest if these things are no longer patentable here, but remain patentable, for example, in China. I don't think it's surprising. It's the kind of thing that Congress would turn its attention to. We know that the current unclear state of affairs of patent law across these industries is affecting investment decisions in a range of industries, right? uh, including biotechnology, of course, um, after the Myriad case that was described by Ms. Park came out, at first there was a sense that the Supreme Court maybe was trying to write a very narrowly focused decision that only related to patents on human genes. Right? But that very quickly turned out not to be the case, and businesses that have absolutely nothing to do with human genes or human genetic diagnostic testing quickly became impacted. Uh, we, we quickly saw examples of patent applicants, for example, uh, who sought applications on purified preparations of new antibiotic substances that they had discovered in, in obscure, previously unknown ground-dwelling fungi. Right? And these applications got stuck in the patent office. And the logic was, and I think quite reasonably, that patent examiners said, look, the Supreme Court said you can't patent uh, a DNA that you, quote, merely extracted from uh, a natural organism. So, so if you can't patent the DNA you get from the bacterium, how can you patent the antibiotic that you get from the same bacterium? Well, that made no sense to patent examiners. Frankly, it wouldn't make sense to a lot of other people as well. The result, though, is that patent applications uh, are being denied if they claim purified or enriched preparations of fermentation products, uh, industrial enzymes, antibiotics, and other medicinal substances. Um, and, uh, and that also patents got invalidated, even though they have nothing to do uh, with human DNA or any DNA at all. Uh, again, this is affecting uh, investment decisions, uh, even in important areas um, to our industry, like biomarker-assisted therapies, uh, and other precision medicine applications which require large investments that would not be made uh, if we make patents unavailable for these kinds of investment-intensive technologies. Um, so, so I would commit to you right, that Congress's effort is not to, um, to relitigate cases that were litigated 10 years ago. Um, lawmaking is, as a general proposition, always prospective. Right? So any law Congress would pass in this area is only going to apply to new patent applications that are filed going forward. If there is a concern that uh, any law that Congress might pass would make, if you will, human genes patentable again in their form, uh, that would be very hard to see how that could be the case because the human genome was published uh, 20 years ago, it's been very heavily studied, it's very well published, it's very searchable. So in other words, it's hard to see, even if Congress were to pass a law, and even assuming for the sake of argument that it would confer patent eligibility on preparations of DNA molecules that are newly discovered, it's hard to see how anyone in this day and age would discover a new human gene 
and ask for a patent to it. It's, there are simply none left to be discovered for patenting for the most part, right? And even, you know, whatever there might be, we can talk about this separately, would make very little sense for anyone to try and get a patent on. Uh, Senator Tillis, the leader of this effort, I think at least twice during the hearing said uh, they have absolutely no intention uh, of creating uh, a new regime for patenting human genes, right? if only for the reason that they've all already been described and are well known. Um, I would perhaps end with just one or two observations about unintended consequences, because that, I think, is a legitimate concern to raise. All legislation can have unintended consequences, right? And I think people who have concerns uh, are correct in coming forward and voicing their concerns and explaining them uh, and, and ask for those concerns to be addressed. Um, the legislators that we talk to, again, are trying to fix and provide clarity for a problem that affects uh, a cross-section of American industry. So to the extent there are particularized concerns about the effect perhaps on research or on patient care, I think those ought to be articulated. And the legislative process is always one of sausage making eventually, right, where particularized concerns will be heard uh, and to the extent it's doable can be addressed. I will uh, refer back, for example, to uh, a bill that was introduced some years ago by Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, which I think is an example of the targeted solution that could be offered to concerns that are legitimate. Um, the ACLU, um, as Ms. Park will confirm, when the uh, Myriad case was going up, the Association for Molecular Pathology case was going up to the Supreme Court, uh, I think effectively used as a leading argument in public discourse, not so much in the courts, the argument that uh, at the time when Myriad was the only one to provide comprehensive BRCA testing, women could not get a second opinion. Even if they received a test result from Myriad, there was no one else to go to. Uh, to have the test redone if that was what the patient desired. Right? So Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz, quite persuaded by the argument, said, let's find a, a policy solution for this. Right? There ought to be a way to do this short of doing away with all patents on such technology. And uh, she introduced and got included as an amendment into the then pending patent reform bill, an amendment that would have provided for confirmatory genetic diagnostic testing that was based on the simple proposition that if there's a test provider, and that test provider may have a patent relating to its tests, if that test provider provides a first test, well, then they were already paid for it, and it's no skin off their back if somebody else were to do a repeat test to confirm the results. Nobody gets harmed. Nobody loses any commercial interest that they might have. Uh, and this could be done completely free of patent infringement liability. This provision was included in the bill. We thought at the time it was an example of the targeted accommodation of concerns that could be done, and that provision was struck from the bill uh, you know, at the initiative of the ACLU, which was very worried that this might actually mean that uh, Congress might implicitly endorse patents on such technology and the preferable outcome for ACLU at the time was what they subsequently achieved in the Supreme Court, that broad swaths of patents instead were struck down. But if we have a conversation about targeted solutions and broad solutions, I think this is the time to have it. Uh, the current proposition by ACLU is that we should have no patent law reform in Congress. Right? ACLU and AMP are on record as opposing the whole effort and, and we think that is overbroad because we're dealing with a new phenomenon that did not exist at the time these cases were litigated. We're dealing with a current problem in patent law, and I find it hard to believe uh, that stakeholders would rather have a world where artificial intelligence, antibiotic substances, industrial enzymes, and telecommunications inventions were unpatentable, uh, just to make a point. Right? So I would invite 
and this is what we heard from the lawmakers as well, uh, interested stakeholders to come forward uh, to particularize their concerns and to go through the normal legislative process where these concerns will be evaluated and there will probably be ways to address a larger number of them than most people would assume. So, so that's what I had. I just want to leave you with a final thought because we hear it so often from our member companies that to the extent you all are asking yourselves, what might this mean for my organization, my constituency, for our patients? Um, uh, we think that to the extent the, uh, um, the disease states that you're dealing with uh, are so unexplored that they will require significant investment, right? and to the extent you want to attract uh, private stakeholders, companies, to work with you and spend money on research and developing therapies. Um, that in our belief, our companies all tell us it would be very counterproductive to take away the availability of patents because patents are empirically important to attract investment and to spend money on the development of cures and new treatments. Right? Your disease state may be one that is so unexplored that it is currently largely being addressed through academic research and very early stage research. And so, so you may not need a lot of corporate investment or private stakeholders. But I think every organization in that sense will be different. And, and I, I think you all know best, uh, you know, what kind of investment and attraction, attraction of private capital will be required in your particular situation. So thank you for that. If you have questions, please like communicate them. I don't know if there will be time on the call, but I'm all yours at this point. Thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thank you so much, Hans um, and Sandra. Um, we're going to move along in the agenda. Um, and next we have Eric Sed with the Office of Rare Disease Research at NCAT. Um, are you there, Eric? Yeah, can you hear me, Shannon? Yes, perfect. Go okay. ahead. Great. Great. Uh, and I know that we don't uh, have too much time left and we still have a couple more uh, presentations. So I'll try to um, skip through some of the information I have on, on some slides that's a little bit too uh, content heavy. Um, so my name is, is Eric Sid again, and I'm a Presidential Management Fellow from the uh, National Institutes of Health, um, specifically with the uh, National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, also known as NCATS, and the uh, Office of Rare Disease Research. Uh, I'm going to be sharing with you today one of our new programs um, called RADAR, but I wanted to talk to you briefly about the mission of our office, which is about accelerating rare disease research to benefit patients. A lot of the work we do at NIH oftentimes focuses on scientists and clinicians, but we actually also do a lot um, directly with patients as well as patient groups. Next slide, please. Um, specifically in my office, as well as within my center, there are a large number of resources we have. I'm not going to spend time talking on many of those, so we're going to focus primarily on this new program that we have in that uh, red dotted uh, box on the bottom right, but there are definitely other resources we have available for patient organizations as well. Next slide, please. So uh, as a little bit of background first, um, there are oftentimes a lot of different definitions for what registries are. Uh, this is my definition based off of the uh, AHRQ, the Agency for Healthcare Quality uh, Research. Um, uh, and basically, I look at registries as a translational tool. Um, registries are organized systems to collect uniform information with a defined purpose, a target population, and a method. And when we talk about uniform information, really what we're thinking about is data. Uh, it's a scary term sometimes for non-scientists, but really we're talking about collecting patient information on either their contact information, demographics, um, perhaps about their background, or information coming from a clinician about their medical situation. Next slide, please. When we talk about rare disease registries in particular, there are a lot of unique features with this, mainly because when you talk about rare diseases, it's a very different situation. Every single research participant matters in the creation of, of your research study. Um, when you talk about a disease like diabetes that has 30 million uh, patients in the US, that's a very different situation statistically than when you talk about a disease that only has 100 patients in the US. So it's really important that we have every single member um, of a patient community uh, involved and kind of aware about what research efforts are occurring and potentially what they may be able to participate in. Next slide, please. 
going along uh, those lines, when we talk about data, this is where I live as a scientist and a clinician, um, patient experience data has a lot of different terms. I won't go through these in de detail, but this is how scientists, FDA, NIH, um, academicians, uh, industry, what we talk about when we think about data and research. Next slide. But when we talk about for patients, patient groups in particular oftentimes talk about stories. Registries are a great resource to help translate your stories into data that can really be used to talk to researchers or industry folks or, you know, regulators. So really that's the key point about thinking about why um, registries are so important as well as when we talk about actually using registries, it's really important to keep different priorities in mind. Next slide, please. So there are many, many different resources available to teach you what to do and how to do a registry. We didn't want to redo all that existing work. Rather than doing that, we wanted to focus on the bigger questions that when we work with patient groups, we hear that you have. What are your priorities? Which should you start out with? What are important principles to keep in mind so that your registry is able to really function downstream? We've heard again and again and again of stories, of examples, of problems that people will, you know, lessons people will learn as they go through the process of developing a registry. And rather than trying to, you know, again, create another resource out there amongst many others, what we're really looking at is how do we make sure that the registry you develop, whatever means uh, that you kind of take to do that, how does it have the um, data standards and quality to make sure that that registry is usable downstream for whatever purposes you're keeping in mind? If that's for therapy development, what are the requirements for FDA to be able to look at the data that you're potentially producing? And this is a really important thing because sometimes this is something that will catch up with you, not you know, next year, but it could be five to 10 years down the line. So really that's kind of the, the, the background we had behind why we wanted to develop this resource. Next slide, please. So what we did is we built a, a new website. This is a program called um, Radar, Rare Disease Registry, which is really just a uh, website that takes a lot of similar themes from other resources we've developed for patient organizations. Next slide, please. What we did was um, we looked at this uh, resource you see on the top right. This is the ARC manual. Um, this is the gold standard for how to go about creating a uh, patient registry uh, or any type of registry in general. However, that's a two volume book. It's about, I wanna say 500 pages long. They're, they're about to come out with another volume, um, another edition um, soon. And it's rather complex. It's in very, very um, kind of technical uh, detail uh, and language uh, for compared to somebody that may be coming in and just asking a simple question of, well, how do I know who's in my community? Where are other patients? How many patients have this disease in general in the country or in the world? So. We, what we did is we took the information from that manual as well as other resources, and we're trying to just condense that down into thinking, where are most patient groups at in terms of their research um, you know, framework? Where do they need to kind of move forward? And what's the stepwise approach for this? So we're developing this uh, iteratively, and we're designing it so that we can get feedback from the community. And this is really not, um, I would say, just from our perspective. This is really coming from patient organizations. So. With that in mind, um, we're starting out with a current phase focused entirely on contact and demographic information. Essentially, how do you identify the patients that have their disease, and how do you find out which one of, the, of those are interested perhaps in participating in research and might be uh, recruitable to clinical trials? Um, later on, we plan to expand to more complex areas within registries, but again, this is being done iteratively so that we can make sure that we're really addressing patient organization needs. Next slide, please. So that's kind of the background. What exactly does this look like? Um, we took the, all the information out there on, you know, how do you build a contact and demographic registry? And we tried to simplify it into the fewest number of general steps that we could. So we looked at two realms, you know, one area around setting up, one area around managing. And what we did was we just tried to create a, a simple skeleton on how to navigate through this process. Next slide, please. So as an example, um, you know, the first step in creating a contact uh, and demographic registry is really about trying to organize your community. Um, many of you that have backgrounds in terms of, uh, for example, with business administration know that it's really important to have a good program plan in mind. So what we did is we just mapped out what exactly should that program plan look like for building a registry. Next slide. 
And again, all we did was there's already plenty of existing resources. Um, one of our efforts focuses on, it's called the um, toolkit for uh, patient focused therapy development. And it focuses on just gathering all these different resources from within the community, from um, both federal agencies, but also you know, different patient groups, different uh, industry groups, um, really any resources that have uh, good quality and are useful for for patients, uh, patient organizations as a whole, we took those resources, we organized which of those fit within that framework and, and, and specifically at which point in that framework, what's the first step that you would get started with, um, what are good kind of general features to keep in mind between these different resources, and how do you take that first step? What is the first actionable step that you would need? Next slide, please. So as an example, um, what we've been trying to do is gather example templates from different patient organizations and just blanking out some of the uh, details that are specific to that, perhaps that disease or that organization. And then from there, creating these general templates that really can apply to any organization. So what you see here is just the example template looking at how do you compare different data collection methods? And all it was is looking at what are different questions that patient organizations would have in mind and again, what are resources they're building around that? Next slide, please. Um, so again, this, I know I kind of went through that uh, pretty quickly, but I wanted to be respectful for the other presenters as well. Um, as a whole, this is a website you can go ahead and uh, explore. It's already launched. Um, it's an educational program that's really acting as, uh, I would say, a repository for community resources. And we, we're, our entire kind of function is really just providing some of that step-by-step -step guidance as well as making sure that it's based on good data practices so that your registry has really, again, a, a future usability um, as far as what roles that you might have uh, in mind for that registry. Um, the current launch is focused much more on contact and demographic information, and it's a living website. So it's designed, again, to share your tools, your resources, your suggestions, and it's really kind of, uh, again, it's, it's our way of trying to collect all this common knowledge within the patient community and just try to put it in a single resource and make that, you know, again, as more of a, a neutral kind of stance that based off of um, our perspective uh, as NIH and kind of focusing on research quality. So that's, uh, you know, my rough kind of quick run through of a uh, uh, radar program. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions, um, investigate the website yourself. And definitely if you know that you have, uh, you know, for example, if you already created a registry and you've gone through uh, a certain particular you know, use case, a learning question, a, a situation that you don't want others to kind of make the same mistake for, let us know and let us know how we can kind of build information out on that. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, so Patricia is on the line to discuss the uh, Lymphedema Treatment Act update. Patricia? Are you there, Patricia? Uh-oh. Uh, let's See. Um, oh no. Um, so are you there? I'm so sorry. Um All right. Um I think we'll skip ahead. Um if anyone has questions about the Lymphedema Treatment Act, feel free to reach out to me and I can put you in touch with Patricia. Um, and these slides will be available also on our website after the call. Um, the recording gets posted at rareadvocates.org backslash webinars after each of these um, meetings. So feel free to um, search for it there. Lindsay, are you on the line? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Go ahead. Um, yep, you can skip to the next slide, please. Great. Um, all right, thank you. Hey, everyone. Our uh, Director of Public Policy, Steve, was unable to join us on the call today, so I'm just filling in to give you a brief update on Community Congress. For anyone on the call who's unfamiliar, uh, Community Congress is our membership-based program at Every Life. The program is dedicated to bringing uh, together patient organizations, industry leaders, and other rare disease stakeholders. We believe that everyone should share the same seat at the table when it comes to discussing urgent policy issues. The Congress itself serves as a strategic ad, uh, advisory council and consists of three different working groups, newborn screening, 
public policy and uh, the regulatory committee. Each of those groups has two different co-chairs, one from industry and one from a patient organization. I will also add that membership is free for all 501c patient organizations. Next slide. A uh, quick uh, overview of the mission of the newborn screening working group. Uh, the uh, mission is for ensuring patients to receive earliest access and diagnostic opportunities through newborn screening. This year's priorities the group is focusing on is the reauthorization of the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Act. This is a federal bill. Uh, they will also be focusing on supporting state coalitions and adding conditions to the rest and identifying and promoting the future of diagnostic tools. Next slide. For our regulatory group, uh, the mission is to focus on improving the regulatory process and advancing regulatory science for rare disease therapies. Uh, this year, this group is focusing on working with FDA on more flexible clinical trial designs and biomarkers. Uh, looking at the obstacles faced by small clinical trial designs and coming up with strategies to overcome them. Uh, this group is also focusing on creating a dialogue with FDA and different patient communities and promoting the proposed FDA Rare Disease Center of Excellence. Next slide. Uh, last but not least, the third uh, working group for this Congress, uh, we've got the Public Policy Group. Their mission is closing the innovation gap for the 95% of rare diseases that have no FDA approved treatment and ensuring patients receive the earliest access to treatment opportunities. For 2019 priorities, this group is pursuing the NASM study of the economic and societal burden for rare diseases. You may have also heard us refer to this as the burden study. Uh, they will also be focusing on conceptualizing legislative and regulatory policies to build upon the Orphan Drug Act. Next slide. What's next for Community Congress? Just a reminder of anyone who is already a part of this advisory council, we've got our mid-year webinar uh, coming up next week. This includes all working groups and it's taking place on June 19th at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Those of you in the DC area are free to join us in person at the Rare Hub. Uh, for those of you who will be joining remotely, you're free to join us via webinar. Uh, another reminder that this webinar is followed by our survey that we encourage all members of the Congress to participate in. Uh, if you are already part of the Congress and have not received an invite, please reach out to us if you are not part of the Congress and are interested in joining, you can join at any time throughout the year. Just read out, reach out to myself if you're part of a patient organization or Ted from our development team if you are part of an industry. That's it for me. Thanks, Shannon. Great. Thanks, Lindsay, so much for joining us. So um, this is Shannon, and I'm going to give a quick update on Rare Across America. If you haven't already heard about our Rare Across America program, it was previously called In-District Lobby Days, and it's an opportunity for advocates to meet with their federal legislators in the district offices during the month of August. RDLA schedules the meetings for the advocates in the district offices of their representatives and senators, and we do training webinars and we provide resources um, such as one-pagers, and other materials to help prepare advocates for those meetings as well. And so advocates can attend one meeting or all three meetings, depending on their schedule and availability. Um, so we're pretty flexible. Um, so the dates, the important dates for Rare Across America, the registration is open till July 3rd, and you can register at rareacrossamerica.org. We will have an, an informational webinar um, about the meetings that they'll be having, um, how to have a successful meeting, what to expect during the meeting with their legislators, and um, some legislative asks that advocates can have during their meetings. Um, of course, we also leave the door open for advocates to make other legislative asks that are important to them or their disease community. And that webinar will be held on July 25th 
And then the advocates will meet with their members of Congress during the summer recess, which uh, starts on July 29th and goes till September 8th. If you have any questions um, about the program, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, we have so far 272 participants registered from 46 states to participate. Um, our goal is to have meetings in all 50 states. So we need a little bit of help to get to that goal. We currently don't have any participants registered yet from Hawaii, Montana, North Dakota, and Wyoming. So if you know of any advocates in those states, please encourage them to <coughs> register. Um, we also have two or less participants registered from the following states, Alaska, Connecticut, Iowa, Idaho, Kansas, Kentucky, Maine, Minnesota, Nebraska, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, South Dakota, Vermont, and West Virginia. So if you are from one of those states, um, I encourage you to register, uh, and if you know anyone, please uh, encourage them as well, um, because there really is power in, in the numbers, and the more people we have registered from states, the more representatives' offices will be able to um, have meetings in. So um, it's important to have as many advocates as possible register. Um, so um, please reach out to me if you have any questions about Rare Across America. Um, you can uh, forward any emails that I've sent about it to people that you know. We have some uh, social media posts on the RDLA uh, Facebook and Twitter accounts that you're free to share or retweet as well. Um, and then it's just about 1 o'clock, so we will close. But a little reminder that our next RDLA meeting will take place on July 18th. We do not have one scheduled for August since um, DC slows down during that month. Um, but if you would like to speak on a topic or if you're really interested in a particular topic to be discussed um, on one of these meetings, please reach out to me um, and let me know and um, we can do our best to find a speaker to fit the, um, whatever topic you're interested in learning more about. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us on the phone and in person. Um, thank you so much. And we will um, see you on or hear from you on July 18th. Thank you.